I'm a farrier, which is a person who puts shoes on horses and has blacksmithing skills. And I have two children, a wife, a couple of dogs, and I live in Orinda. I've been with horses my whole life, and I was do, I had several small businesses that I, I owned parts of when I was in my 20s, and I wasn't enjoying that, and so I wanted to make horses, somehow make a career out of working with horses. I thought that I wasn't a good enough rider, I didn't want to compromise my morals as a trainer. And I thought that shoeing would be a great profession, so I started pursuing that. I did some apprenticeships and um, over a three-year period, and then lots of clinics and seminars. And and you know, 30 years later, this is where I am. The most important skill is that you have to be comfortable with horses, because it'll it'll never work unless you're comfortable with horses, and that's just a gift that you know was given to me my whole life. I've always been comfortable around them. You know, why I'm not sure what makes that up, I don't know. But but I have no fear and um, I have a lot of respect for them. I like working around them. I enjoy them. So you have to be comfortable. Then what you have to learn is you have to be, you know, it's physically demanding. So there's points at which during your career that you have to kind of you know, kind of football player-ish, get past the pain. Because, you know, you get sore. I mean, these guys weigh 11, 12, 13, 1400 pounds. They start leaning on you. They get scared and they jump. I mean, it's a lot of force and a lot of movement. So you have to be willing to deal with the physical aspect of it. And then there's just the skill level of, of learning how to... Um, Train your eye to see, because you're trimming basically, you know, you're trimming their foot, which is, you know, you're trying to, it's a spatial relationship that you're, you're learning how to see what level is and, and how this foot's going to land on the ground. So it's kind of this spherical plastic entity that you learn how to trim. So the foot's grown from the top down, mm -hmm. and I'm cutting out the exfoliated sole which forms a callus on the bottom of the foot to protect it. Like basically inside this structure is blood and bones and skin, okay? And then this is like a shell that protects it, like growing your own shoe, in essence. So I'm cutting it off because the shoe doesn't let it wear down like it would naturally. So I'm cutting the excess off then putting a shoe back on. And as long as you don't cut too much, you're not sore. And, and then there's the whole blacksmithing end of it, which is learning how to forge steel, which takes years and years of just practice. And there were years of, of sitting at home after work practicing, practicing in the garage, putting piles of horseshoes on the ground, that were never used, and and that's an important criteria for, for becoming good at this job. I've had lots of best moments, and, and I recently had a best moment, and that was that um, this very, very talented horse who, you know, I don't know whether she had been abused or what had happened in her life prior to me meeting her. Um, but she's very, very difficult to deal with on the ground. And probably as difficult as any horse I've ever been around to deal with on the ground. And so um, the first time we had to put shoes back on her, um, we heavily sedated her. We had a veterinarian come and we heavily sedated her and we got the job done. And then, you know, in a conference, um, in terms of a strategy as to how we were going to deal with this horse because we certainly didn't want to have to sedate her every time we wanted to put shoes on her and she had a busy show schedule ahead of her so so the first thing I said was that I wanted her moved so that she was right next to where I worked 
And since I'm there two to three days a week at this particular farm, that way, you know, I'd have a lot of contact with her. And so they right away moved her next to where I was. And I began to get a sense of what her issues were and what her fears were and, and what relaxed her. And, um, and last week I was able to take her out of her stall and put shoes on her and there was no problems, there was no freaking out, there was no kicking, there was no breaking the cross ties and running out of the barn like a mad woman. Um, so, you know, when I, can, when I can get past all of a horse's fears and, and get her to relax as, as quickly as I was able to do with this horse, and that's a great moment. So first of all, this is Nora, and this is Nick, and these are two and a half year old whippets, which um, which we found up in Oregon, and they are litter mates, a brother and a sister. And you know, first of all, I love having dogs, and I've had dogs my whole life. And one of the great things about your job as a farrier is is that most of my clients don't have any problem with me bringing my dogs to work. And so, and so not only do they get to be with me a lot and go to work and become smart, knowledgeable, worldly dogs, we'll call them smart, worldly dogs, but they also have the benefit, which is actually what many corporations are finding out today, is that people become more productive because you don't have to rush home to walk your dogs because your dogs are there. And... Um, you know, there's moments where things are tense. Um, you know, everybody's worried about an injured horse. Everybody's worried about a lame horse. Uh, a horse is fractious and upset about something, and you're having trouble getting him to calm down. And, and everybody's nerves are getting frayed. And then you have the two dogs sit there and do something totally ridiculous and just, you know, relax the whole situation and diffuse the whole situation. And basically that's their job. Their job is I feed them and they entertain me. And, and over the years I found that I'm the most relaxed when I have the dogs with me at work. Have I considered different careers? I've done different careers. There was um, a period in the mid-80s where I was just, my body was beaten up. I was uh, shoeing a lot of rough horses. I was tired. And I, and I just, you know, got sick of doing it. I needed a break. And one of my, um, one of my hobbies at that point was mathematical models of the stock market. And uh, I, I talked my way into graduate school without an undergraduate degree. And, um, and I, studied, I studied market timing. And, uh, and I ended up working for a couple of different companies and, and uh, one particular individual and traded the stock market for a few years and uh, as a break. And I was able to support myself doing that. And... You know, after about two and a half years, um, I was ready to go back to shoeing with uh, renewed vigor, so to speak, and, um, and a clear head. I mean, the two times that I've left the profession, you know, that was the longest for the two and a half years. And then one time during an illness, coming back to it was, um, I felt the luckiest person in the world to be able to do it again. And, uh, and every time it, it did anything but increase my desire to be better than, uh, than I could imagine.